please note that this video contains spoilers. Put off by how long this video is, don't worry, I tend to jam-pack my videos with as much content, as many details as I possibly can, and I try to talk pretty fast, so while the video is a bit on the long side, I don't repeat myself, and I get into a lot of details about the subject that you know, pretty much anything that I feel I can comment on and that I think you might find interesting. Lord of the Rings, The Two Towers, movie thoughts. I said pretty much everything I wanted to about the tree ants in the regular review, so all I'll really say is I did enjoy seeing them take out, I guess, Sau Sauron's base, or at least some of it, I do, however, think that there wasn't that much build-up for that particular scene. I feel like maybe... What was it? Mary? I think it was... No, wait, it was Pippin. It was Pip who got the idea of getting the tree towards Isengard. I guess Pip had figured out that he would see the trees and... Yeah, it would, you know, really mess with him, I, I guess. I guess that was the idea, but he didn't say that to Mary, and he didn't let us know, and suddenly we were just seeing these big trees are attacking. I guess, you know, the, that roar he lets out is, you know, a really... He, he says that everything that you say in Old Entish takes a long time to say. And he says it a lot slower than I do too. So presumably that roar, since it's not terribly long, is just like, ah, or something like that. And the other trees join him. I guess they hadn't gone very far either, or maybe the trees ran. And anyway, so yeah, they, they do a lot to Saruman's base, and it's a cool scene. It's, it's, it's a good battle, and I especially like the parts of it that genuinely are just nature sort of taking revenge on industrialism and on those that would not respect nature. The dam being destroyed and the water rushing in over at least parts of the base. That's great because that, that is something, you know, people build dams and, and think, oh, we can control the water if we don't want water in this particular place. And the water, you know, the dam gets burst, water rushes in and really does, you know, have a great effect and yeah, I, I like that that's nature, now, and, and there wasn't even really magic in you know, at play there, so I really appreciate that. One thing I would have liked even better is if it had been all nature, if the, if the trees hadn't been walking and talking, and I don't know, the, I, don't know I suppose they weren't actually stronger than old trees are, but... Yeah, it just, I, I would have appreciated it even more if it had just been that. But I, I like that one of the trees, they, they shot it with flaming arrows and turned it fabulous. And you see it running out into the water and bending over so it, it douses the flames with the water. That was a nice little detail, I like that. And of course, the climactic battle at Helm's Deep. I could go on forever about it. it there's just... It's fantastic. I, I think I said most of what I really wanted to in the regular review about that, so... Yeah, I... What I will praise is the realism. I really felt like there was no... kind of... You know, there, there were a couple of these sort of heroic moments, but they didn't overdo it. You know, you had 
It's Gimli, isn't it? That's the dwarf's name, I think. You have Gimli and Aragorn staying there fending off orcs for just a minute or two. You know, not very long, and then they climb back up. Because they were just buying time so that the excuse me, door could be blocked off better. And then, you know, obviously at the excuse me, at the end, Carl Urban returns finally having something to do in the film, and that's kind of it. Other than that, it feels very, you know, you, you understand the despair, you understand why they're talking about giving up, because it really seems impossible. And it's, it's not one of those scenes where, where, well, we're the good guys, so obviously we can just take out these bad guys, even though we're ridiculously outnumbered, as seen in so many Hollywood movies. No, it actually does have a very realistic approach to it, and you see people going down on both sides. And again, we have a, what was, I, I don't remember the, the name, but one of the elven warriors, I think, elven archers, has this big heroic death where he gets killed by a couple of orcs and then those orcs get, you know, killed. And also, Legolas sliding down the stairs on, I guess, a shield whilst firing arrows all the way. It's kind of stupid, but it's the awesome kind of stupid. I think that pretty well covers the big climactic, and I really like the setup for the third with, you know, the Battle of Helm's Deep is over, excuse me, the, what was it? the battle for Middle-earth is about to begin, something like that. Now, what exactly, how, how exactly did Aragorn manage to read the tracks of Merry and Pippin perfectly in amongst all those other tracks of orcs. You know, he just turned on his CSI senses. I actually half expected that to be like Legolas, what with all these the elven senses. I guess that wouldn't be logical, Captain. And I think that pr that pretty much brings me to Gollum, who, yeah, I've, I've made it no secret in these videos, I just, I find him by far the most interesting aspect, the, the most complex character, and just, you really sympathize with him, you really understand. The, the way they make him look in this, it really does seem like the, the ring is equivalent to doing hard drugs. It's an addiction to him. He's all emaciated, really skinny, and really unpleasant. He's gone. I don't remember if we find out if he actually, if he always talked kind of funny, or if that happened because he's been away from people for so long, but he's very much regressed to a very primal stage. He's not very good with others. You know, he, he immediately attacks. He doesn't talk with them at first. He does attack them at the very beginning, and when they fight back, he fights back. He doesn't run or something. He keeps fighting them. He's, he's not like, you know, it's not like meeting someone, you know, like meeting a stranger, or, you know, or at that, it's like meeting the wrong kind of stranger, the don't take candy from strangers stranger. And you you really do wonder if 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 he is beyond saving if it can be and and he's very you know you understand why Frodo sympathizes so much with him because you can very much see a you know they're they're sort of mirror images of each other or starting to towards being because. We have one who has been with the ring for, what was it, 500 years, I think it was said in the first. And then we have one who has only had the ring on him for a short amount of time. So he is starting to, he, he realizes, and, and, you know, what with 
Boromir, not technically a spoiler since it's said in this movie what happened with him in the first movie, what with him being so obsessed with the ring that he was, you know, trying to kill Frodo to get it. Frodo knows how dangerous, how seductive the ring is, so when he sees this creature seduced by the ring, he understands and he sympathizes. And I suppose it does bring up if, if that should be the reaction, if he is too merciful, if he is too, too forgiving. But I do think that at this stage in the story, there is still some, something of a chance, in my personal opinion. And again, having not read the books, and only judging by the movies, it seems to me like Smeagol could maybe have been saved. Like, with a lot of time, with, with time to build trust back up, and it's kind of botched when the... Yeah, when he's captured by the... Yeah, David Wenham and those guys, because Frodo lures him back in, you know, and he, he doesn't realize that if Frodo hadn't done that, he would have gotten killed. And so, and if, if Frodo, I, I, we don't really see Frodo trying to explain that to him, I suppose he doesn't really get much of a chance. But even if he did try, Smeagol might not believe him. And it, it is that thing, it is, he thought he had friends, he thought that he was liked again for the first time in so long, and when he feels tricked, when he feels betrayed, that was the last straw. You see, I, I love how they explore this. We see, we, we really only see two scenes in this where, well, uh, three, actually, three, where Smeagol and Gollum talk to each other, and the first one indeed culminates in Smeagol telling Gollum to go away. We don't need a lot of scenes establishing that. You know, it goes with the faster pace of this movie than compared to Fellowship. And yes, he, he's convinced that Frodo means him well, that he doesn't need the negative side. And then when he feels betrayed, it instantly comes back. He is tossed to the, you know, yeah, tossed to the ground in front of David Wenham and that, and he instantly starts talking to himself, just completely pulls back into himself and starts talking about how he's been betrayed by them and, and Smeagol, you know, basically giving in to Gollum, giving in to the, the self-hatred. And, you see, yeah, you see, that was all it took because he's so far past, and I think that there might have been a chance if he had had time to build that trust back up. But of course that wouldn't necessarily be made for an interesting drama. And then at the end of the film, Smeagol and Gollum talk again, and Smeagol is still opposed to killing them both. And Gollum really wants them dead, and finally they decide that the ring will do it. And we've already seen over the course of this movie how Frodo becomes, you know, turned by the ring. He, he pulls a sword against uh, Sam, and earlier than that, he's talking to Sam like the ring is the more important thing, like, like it's Sam who wants the ring. He, there's a sort of, uh, you see the jealousy rear its ugly head, the, the jealousy that we've all, already also seen with Gollum. So it is already, and, and as I mentioned in the review of the first, again this is not a spoiler about the first, in the first movie Frodo was an image of innocence, he was pure. And already in this movie, after, after some weeks with the ring, it's starting to take over. 
it, he, he's not wearing it, he's not using it. He, he just has it on him. He is its carrier, its owner. And yet it is really having an effect on him. Really, it, it very much, very nearly gets Frodo to give up the ring to the flying ring wraith. Now, the... I, I also thought it was very effective. I've already talked a little bit about how primal Gollum has gotten. And that, again, is very much in response to not having been around people and having been, some, you know, addicted. That's, that's what we see happen to people who pull away from others, who reject society. You know, they're, they're very antisocial, their, their habits will seem very unpleasant to others. You know, he eats raw food and he, he, he snaps was the neck or something of, of this little animal right in front of Frodo. And yeah, it's, it's just very, you, you know, and, and what's it, Sam? Is like th this is this is wrong. Just we we're gonna cook it, okay? This is, and that is the the sort of the response of society to a type like that. What are you doing? This is wrong. This is how you're supposed to do it. And at the same time, Frodo looks at Smeagol, and clearly, Smeagol is trying to help. Smeagol is trying to please his master. He wants to impress Frodo. He wants to make him happy. Now that, now that Gollum is gone, he's, he's so happy and he really wants to, he, he wants it to just go on. It's, it's like, I don't know if I want to use the word love, but it's, it's a bond. He really feels like it's, uh, and it is unhealthy, of course. It's unhealthy to have that strong. Uh, it's it's maybe like a, a symbiotic relationship, almost to to Gollum, at least to to Smeagol, that he. Yeah, it's it's all depending on Frodo, and that's also why it goes wrong. Now the. Yes, I, I wanted to talk about how, what Smeagol and Gollum are also somewhat like. Smeagol has this very naive, very childlike quality to him. It's sort of the innocence that has been pushed aside by the, the, the more evil emotions that the ring has brought forth in, and what Smeagol refers to as Gollum, or Gollum refers to itself as Gollum, I guess, with the coughing. Uh, the... Yeah, so, so and, and it's very much that Smeagol wants things to turn out well, and, and is very, yeah, like, like I said, naive, and Gollum is kind of this cruel... It's, they have, you know, it's like an abusive relationship, and he he taunts him, he reminds him why he hates himself and why Gollum is part of him. And of course, at this point in the trilogy, we don't know exactly what he's talking about. We only get you know, hints. And again, I'm not going to be spoiling anything other than this movie in this video, and. It's, it's just very effective. I, I think I think we can all pretty much understand the the relationship between Smeagol and Gollum. I think I think everyone has had a time in their life when they were just looking at themselves and they just they didn't feel that good about themselves and so they were telling themselves these horrible things. They were thinking these horrible things about themselves. You know, you don't have any friends, nobody likes you, you're, you're bad, you're evil. 
and it is a, a sort of battle between the more optimistic, you know, the, the good and evil aspects of our nature. And that's what I really find that they just, they do beautifully on. I am, I consider Gollum one of my all-time favorite characters in fiction. It's, it's one of the most compelling and complex characters that just, you really understand why he is the way he is and you see the, you understand why he has become what he has become because obviously he is no longer, you can no longer quite call him good. He is, he is sort of on the middle and balancing on a knife's edge and you really sympathize with him, you really hope that he comes out on the side of good. But at, as of the end of the film, you feel like he probably won't. And it's, it's a very effective tragedy. He's, he's one of the characters I sympathize most with. And I think that more or less covers it. I think also that Circus does just a fantastic job with both performances. For a while I thought all, th I, I was almost going to say all three because I mistook at first Brad Dourif as Grima Wormtongue for also being Circus, but no, they, they do look alike. Anyway, the and, and that again is something where someone is spared and then it leads to something bad because Grima heads right to Saruman and says, oh, just attack this, play, this part of Helm's Deep and you'll get in. You know, so, yeah, maybe they kind of are saying you should probably think about who you're going to show mercy to. Now, yeah, that actually makes me think of it. I understand that apparently in the novel, the king isn't directly possessed. He's just kind of depressed. He's been listening to Grima's lies or something like that. And it's, it is Saruman doing it, but it's not like a direct possession and the, you know it gets straight up exorcist you know Gandalf is all like the power of white compels you and Saruman flees presumably to you know call affirmative action jokes on him Gandalf is in a stand your ground state he's got his covered now the but, but yes, the, the anti circus as both Smeagol and Gollum, they're very distinct and you, you believe both. And you, you can see how both could be part of the same overall person. There, there are different sides to the same person. They're not completely separate entities. And yeah, that, that is very convincing. Smeagol basically wants his precious back as well. It's just maybe not as much of an, maybe not as big a priority to him as it is to Gollum. And Gollum consider it, considers it the only thing. Gollum is the, the addicted half, the half that is given up on everything but the addiction. And that is also something very clear in some Addicts, be it from drugs or something else, there there are a lot of addictions, and drugs are kind of one of the more visible, as far as physical decay, and you know, leading people to 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 spend a lot of money on it, and eventually, often stop robbing to feed their addiction. But there are a lot of other you know, gambling. It can be an addiction. There is what's it called? Shop shopaholic. You know, that can be an addiction. It's basically there's something, there's an emptiness that you're trying to fill with just by keeping on pushing the one button, doing the one thing over and over and over. Sex addiction is also one thing. I, I shouldn't laugh, it's very serious, obviously. I mean that. And 
it's it's very much that's that's what it becomes if if an addiction goes unchecked for long enough that person will reject the rest of the world focus purely on the addiction and he will be more and more destroyed by the way Gollum is more and more destroyed. We were told he, lay, he lived 500 years with the ring, and that was also an unnaturally long time. And that's also something you, you can feel like you're doing well. It, it feels like you're being satisfied, but you're not. You're, you're just, you're addicted, and you, you're, you're taking a shortcut to satisfaction, so to speak. It is, it is never going to fill the emptiness, and very often with addiction, it will also just keep growing to the point where you, you need more and more. That is most definitely the case with drugs. That's also in part because the body becomes adjusted to a certain amount of the drug, hence withdrawal symptoms when you don't get that amount of the drug. But yeah, it's, you're never satisfied. It's it's a way to get to the norm. It's a shortcut to get to the norm. It's instead of dealing with the actual problems, which is, I'm, I'm not judging, it's usually very difficult to deal with the problems causing it, which again is why I greatly appreciate this depiction of it, and in such a a movie that so many can watch. This is not, you know, someone lying on the floor puking from having done too much, I don't know, cocaine, I guess. I, I don't know a lot about specific drugs. I, anyway, it's, it's, it's a creature complaining that he, he can't have his precious back. You know, it's, I, I don't know how much children will completely understand it, but they can maybe, you know, it will hopefully at least lodge in their memory for later, and they might be able to recognize addiction. Because again, I think that this is how we should tell people about addiction, tell them that it's not, it doesn't make someone a bad person, and if you really are there for them, and you really support them, they can actually get better. And I think that pretty well covers it. Please rate and comment, and hey, if you like this video, that subscribe button's just waiting for you to click it.